so thanks everyone to come to this uh, three o'clock talk. So like the, the graveyard shift in the afternoon. But we're going to be talking about um, hacking and secure, securing Android apps. Uh, my name is Dan, and I'm director of technology at a company called X Design. So we're based in Edinburgh, uh, and we, we do sort of digital consultancy. So what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to go through two different security, um, not vulnerabilities, security vulnerabilities found in two different applications. The first one was an IPC, so an inter-process communication attack that led to an account takeover. And then the other one was a directory traversal, which also led to an account takeover. And I'll end by talking a bit about how you can protect yourselves against similar types of attacks. I'll talk a little bit about like process um, and then mostly about the specifics of what you could have done to prevent them. So um, just to put your mind at ease, both of these attacks, both of these vulnerabilities have been publicly dis disclosed. And then at the end, I've got um, a QR code, and there's a write up and then links to the vulnerability reports if you want to have a look afterwards. So the first vulnerability was in an application called Basecamp. Just, I guess, show of hands, how many people have actually come across Basecamp before? Cool, a couple of people. Um, my second question was going to be, does anyone work there? But I'm going to guess not with that number of people. Uh, so that's um, so Basecamp, if you're not aware, it's a, they call it a collaboration tool. It's designed with businesses. Um, you can do things like upload documents and then share, with the, share them with people. So a bit like a SharePoint replacement. You can also send images and it's got built-in chat and things like that. So I guess the key is that there's a lot of data that's held there from businesses and they don't necessarily want that to be compromised. So I'll just first talk about um, a feature that they have in there. It's a fairly standard feature, um, and it is for sharing stuff. So typically what will happen is someone will upload a document onto Basecamp's site. So in the, again, in the same way as like Google Drive or um, SharePoint or something like that. After that, they'll generate a link, um, and this will return like a, normally a link with a unique ID at the end of it. And then they can send that link via um, email or WhatsApp or whatever, whatever the medium is. And once someone clicks on that link, it'll open it up inside the Android application if it's installed. So you've probably all seen this before. It's like a, a pretty typical flow. Um, in Android, um, apologies if there's any Android developers in here, and I'm about to tell you some quite sort of fundamental stuff. But in Android, we use an intent receiver in order to process these kind of links. So once someone's clicked on that link, it'll open up the app using that link, and the bit of code that handles it is, uh, lives in something called the intent receiver. The intent receiver for this app, this Basecamp app, it uses, it does a quick check of, um, does the URL start with 3.basecamp.com? So that's obviously their domain. That's like a place that they could, uh, a site that they can control, what kind of content goes up there, and it's obviously safe for you to send things like tokens to. If the, um, if the URL that it's just opened does not start with 3.basecamp.com, then it will just kick it out to an external browser. So essentially, you'll be in the app, and it will kick you out into um, like Chrome or Brave or whatever you've got installed. If it does start with it, then it starts the process of breaking down that link to see what, uh, what type of link it is and then decides what to do with it. So for example, if it ends .png, it will infer that it's an image type and then open up the image viewer to display that. If it's a PDF, it'll do the PDF viewer. Again, kind of the sort of behavior you'd expect with an app. So obviously, um, this 3.basecamp.com, I kind of alluded to it there. The reason that they do this check, one would assume, is that um, they only want to, they want to make sure that only like things from their trusted domain are opened inside the app and that anything else, so if it's dodgy or malware or whatever, that doesn't get opened up inside the app. So it's a sort of security feature. So inside building this up well, you can probably see all the stuff that's going to happen from here. So inside this big block of code, um, inside this intent receiver, and I think this actually might have been one of the problems was the, the class for dealing with it was absolutely massive, but kind of like from decompiling it, you could see um, it had this block of, t block of code in there. 
So if the URL contains or ends with slash verify question mark, then it would take the query parameter, which was proceed underscore two, and then the final block here is it takes that proceed underscore two parameter and opens up something called web view activity. So activity, for anyone who's not familiar, is um, in like, I guess the most basic explanation is it's like a screen on Android. So it's gonna open up a screen and the web view part of it is a kind of like in when you see apps that have um, web browsers embedded as part of the application. And there is a subtle difference to the user, but a really big difference programmatically between an external browser that someone's you know navigating normally and actually embedding a web view inside your app. So if we can, we can go through the, the, the whole kind of chain that if I pass in something that's 3.basecamp.com forward slash verify proceed underscore to hackwebsite.com. So obviously this would be an example where proceed to, which would then get opened up, is a hacker controlled website and not basecamp.com. So it does start with 3.basecamp.com. It does end with verify question mark. And so I will take that proceed and score two parameter and then open up a web view. So kind of at this point in the, um, in the attack, we're executing inside the application, which is great, and I can execute as much JavaScript as I want. However, in Android and also in iOS, by default, if you're executing inside a web view, you basically can't do anything fun. So you can't, ex um, you can't interact with the device at all. You can't execute any like um, anything to do with the file system. You can't um, retrieve or send any anything um, onto the operating system. It is basically like very restricted and very well sandboxed. So at first glance, this sort of thing was useless. I could basically just open up a web page, which if you know getting somebody to click a link and that opens up a web page isn't particularly exciting. Thankfully, um, Basecamp, they've developed a um, library. I say thankfully, thankfully for me, not so good for them. They've developed a library uh, which is um, called Turbo. And the point of Turbo is basically for people who are writing web applications where they want to take that code and uh, be able to reuse it inside an app a mobile application. And the idea is that you can kind of switch between the two. So if you want to just part implement some native mobile stuff and mostly implement it on the web browser, then you can just like kick people between those two screens. So one example is like a PDF viewer on a native app is normally a better experience. So if you're going to open up a PDF, uh, you'll use this turbo library to open it up inside like a native um, looking PDF viewer. And then in order to do this, they use a technique that's available, it's on iOS and it's on Android called JavaScript bridging. So if we take a typical JavaScript web view that is sandboxed and say that we want to execute some native code underneath that's, you know, like that you've deliberately written to be execu executed from JavaScript, then you would use something called JavaScript bridging. So just to kind of draw it out, Say we've got this function here in JavaScript. It's called perform native, what did I call it? Perform native action, and it takes a string. What you do is define um, a bit of code underneath in, in your native programming language, so in Java or Kotlin, and uh, call it the same thing and make sure it takes the same parameters. And that kind of lets you execute functions, um, but very specific ones that are, that are able to interact with the device in a bit more of a, um, like an interesting way and actually make use of, some, of the fact that you're executing on a mobile platform. So as part of Turbo, they defined a function called open native image viewer. So the purpose of this function and actually the whole library was to allow for seamless navigation between a web view and the native application. So it's kind of, exactly like that PDF example I've used. So imagine they've written their web app, it uses a load of HTML and JavaScript for the, the majority of it, but you wanna, you wanna use like a native image viewer, so you can do things like pinch to zoom and you can do caching and stuff like that. So they've got this bit in there that when I click on uh, a list of images, I wanna get a bigger picture for example, it'll then um, intercept my click 
and then execute this native function, so it's written in Java, to open the native image viewer. So again, the way that it will work is I'll upload this image to the Basecamp server. Someone will see it and then click on it in some inside HTML, and that will execute some JavaScript on the device, which will execute the open native image viewer. And then at that point, what it does is goes to the URL on Basecamp's website in order to download uh, that image. So kind of native image viewer needs to download the image before it can display it. As a result of the fact that that image might be something sensitive, so imagine like you've been um, workshopping all day and you take a picture of the whiteboard and then upload that to Basecamp. You, and I, I guess in line with best practice, you wanna make sure that those images aren't just exposed to anyone on the web. You wanna um, um, authenticate it and the way that they did this was using JWDs. So basically, when it makes that request to get the image, it'll send a token with it and then the server can verify that that's the user. So if we um, now go through the um, original attack, if I've got this one here, and it's basically the same thing we showed before, but with slash script at the end of it, and then that'll download this little block of code here. So I'm not sure, that's quite big, so you can, everybody can see that, right? So the download URL there is the, probably the important one. So what it means is that once you've executed Open Native Image Viewer, it'll go to the, um, I call it my dodgy website, and this is the same kind of image, but instead of going to what it thinks is Basecamp's image server, this time it's going to my server. And then because it thinks it's, it still thinks it's authenticating itself with the image server, in this case, it will send the JWT um, and I will be able to intercept them. So to just replay the whole attack. So the first step is to create a link. So we create a, a special link that does start with 3.basecamp.com, has verified question mark, and then points to a web server which has my script code in it, my JavaScript in it. The app will open up that web view activity with the target URL, download and execute that script. That in turn will um, execute this bridging function which will open the native image viewer. And then as part of downloading the image that it thinks is coming from Basecamp server, it'll send the JWTs in the request, and then I can store them and use them. So once you've got JWTs, I'm guessing most of you all realize this is already quite bad, but you can use that token then to execute um, commands as if you're that user essentially, so it's as if you're logged in. Um, and I kind of tested this out with the base count just by intercepting API calls and sending them different people's tokens as part of it, so that's kind of from that point, you've, kind of, you've got access to the account as if they're logged in. So that's, that's the kind of first vulnerability. Um, the second vulnerability is in an app uh, which maybe more people have heard of, which is Slack. I, I won't ask for a show of hands. I'm gonna guess most people have heard of Slack before, but just in case you haven't, this is something where um, kind of no matter how strict your security policies are, like a lot of personal information, a lot of like business critical information gets sent over Slack um, along with files and things like that. So again, it's something that you would ideally not want the data to be compromised for. So I've pitched this at the beginning, so apologies for a lot of the people in the room who I'm about to teach what directory traversal is, but there are potentially some people who um, are new to it. So um, directory traversal is where it, imagine you take this JSON object here and the file name there is used uh, in order to like name the file on disk and then you can also control the file content. So imagine that this then is the code that you would use to, use to execute on that JavaScript. So what you can see is, and this is um, an Android looking file directory, so it's data data my app private, and if you take the response.file name from that previous JSON, it should go to data data my app private my file.txt. And the response content then is file content, so your file should then have the content of ABC if you use what was in the last, last example. So directory traversal is what, you, what happens if you use exactly the same block of code, but on this 
So this time, instead of uh, myfile.txt, we've got dot dot slash myfile.txt. And essentially what the dot dot slash does is moves up a directory level for every dot dot is in there. So previously, we were going to data data my app private, myfile.txt. In this example, you go to data data my app myfile.txt. And you can go all the way up with that. In normal kind of like non-mobile things, this is probably one of the more serious vulnerabilities that you can get because it could usually mean that you're able to overwrite binary files. So um, normally if you've, you've done this and the process is operating as root, you'd overwrite like some bin files that um, operate, that uh, execute at startup and drop malware. Uh, and if not, then um, you start to have to play with a little bit of things that you're able to ex have permission to. So for example, if you're executing as a lower privilege user and you can only modify files that you have access to, which is the case in Android, so you can't overwrite like system binaries of, as an app, you can only mess with files that you have access to, then you have to start looking at changing other things and often overwriting configuration files. So back to Slack. So the, the vulnerability kind of started, or sorry, the attack kind of started with an undocumented upload API call. So there are, there's a couple of different ways of uploading files in Slack, and this one I found just by looking at the, the networking request in the web browser. So essentially, the way that you can do it is you can send the file in one request, and you can also send the file name in another request. So you can probably see it on there. So there's basically a, um, the, a JSON at the end where you can set the file name and it's very similar to our example. It's dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, shid, underscore, prefs, abc.xml. And what this essentially meant is that at this point is obviously just uh, uploaded the file, but you're able to set the file, and it, it's not checking for dot, dot, slashes. It's not like removing any direct potential directory traversal attached from there. So at this point, I've kind of got a file where I can put whatever content I want into it, um, and I can also put whatever the file name is I want to be. Like I say, that's not that useful on its own because I need something to be able to um, use that file in order to exploit it. But thankfully, this code is its actually surprisingly similar to the code that I showed earlier on. So that downloads path is the, um, it's like a, a static variable or a set, you know, it's hard coded on disk and it's data data com.slack forward slash downloads. That second downloads path is the one that I showed you in the previous example. So that basically corresponds to the file name that I would be, you, um, be setting when I upload the file to Slack. Which is great because now what I've got is I've got a way of uploading a file with a directory traversal path in it and I have some code on the Android device which is gonna execute that. So I can upload the file with whatever content I want. I can set the, the, the directory and exactly where and whatever the file name I want. But I struggle for quite a long time with where I actually wanted it to go. And the reason for that is I mentioned uh, on Android that uh, um, applications will typically, they'll like execute as a user that only has access to their own files. And there were days where people were, um, you were able to overwrite like shared, ob shared object files that things had downloaded, but um, for all its bad rap, like Android has really like made a lot of progress in making things um, much harder to exploit. And one of the things they've done is the, uh, the place that shared object libraries get, download get extracted to and downloaded to, they're not writable anymore. There are also, there's some applications, not, not that many, that will like download .jar files and execute them, and Slack, unfortunately, was not one of them. So I was a bit stuck on what I was gonna start trying to overwrite. But I eventually was kind of like digging around the file system looking for some inspiration, and I found a file called Flannel. And after doing a bit of Googling, which is basically top search result, Flannel and Slack came up with what it is, which is, an application level cache, edge cache to make Slack scale. It was a very helpful blog post for me. I'm not sure it was kind of like exactly what they had intended, but it works exactly as you'd expect a cache to work. So at the bottom, you've got the application and that will call out to um, the cache server. 
the cache server will see if it has the result for the, you know, like I'm make, say I'm making a request for my chats. If I make that request and the cache server doesn't have it, it'll call the, bet, the, um, the main Slack server, cache the result for the next request and then return the data to me. And obviously, because it's, I'm requesting information, I'll be sending an auth token as part of the request. So I'll be sending my JWT again. So this flannel file has um, the URL of the flannel cache on disk. And the reason for that is basically that the operation of the cache is that the application will periodically check out for a new cache. I think it's every, I can't remember what it was, 24 hours or something like that. But you'd have a cache like for, for about 24 hours. And then after 24 hours, it would go off and request a new cache URL. And my assumption is it was so that Slack can like scale them out as demand needs and then scale them back in where, um, when, there's, when there's less demand and you'll kind of get one you know, you'll get a, um, get the cache URL for the least overloaded one, and they might spit up new ones. But essentially what I had on file was this flannel file.xml and flannel URL, which pointed to that cache. So I kind of now knew that I wanted to, um, that I had an, a few options for what I wanted to upload, and I wanted to upload something that was going to overwrite that file. So I now know where I want it to go, which is to overwrite that flannel file.xml. So the final bit of this to actually make it work was um, Slack has, for some reason, multiple blocks of code for downloading a file. And like it has at least two. And this one would only execute in very specific circumstances. So it wasn't just like if someone was hitting the download button, it was if somebody um, sent them a file, Slack tries to render it. So for example, if it's an image, it'll try and render that image um, when it receive, when you, you know, receive the Slack message. And if it can't render the image, then you'll get this like little open button. And it was that open button that I needed to be visible because when someone clicked it, that's what executed the vulnerable code. So I ended up in this like bit of a tricky situation where I needed it to be an XML file because I needed to overwrite this XML file that was on disk, um, which meant that I needed it to end.xml. But if I did that, then it, it sort of knows how to render XML. So uh, yeah, it was, I had to basically do one of the things that uh, they were conflicting with each other. Thankfully, they can't render files if they're greater than one megabyte. So I basically just put tons of rubbish in there and then a bit of valid XML at the end, which overwrote that flannel file. And that's the sort of open button talk I was talking about there. So if, if you send a file to a user and they click that open button, it'll download this script onto, um, it'll, sorry, execute that block of code with a flannel file, overwrite the file that's there, and then, um, from there, the next time the Slack calls out, it'll call out to my server. So to put it all together again, the first step is obviously uploading a vulnerable file with um, a directory traversal in it and uploading that to Slack. Once I've got, once I've uploaded that file, I would then basically use just normal Slack stuff to send that file to the person that I wanted to attack. When they hit open, that executes the download function, the kind of vulnerable download function. And when that happens, it will um, overwrite the file on disk, that flannel file. And when it does that, then the next time that it, uh, the, um, ba it was basically anything, any time Slack tried to do anything, it would try and do it via the cache. So you just had to wait a few seconds and it would, it would call out. And as part of doing that, it'll send your, the JWT so one of the bonuses with this one as well was, say like a, some people may be logged into multiple Slack organizations. So you might be like, I don't know if anyone's got a family Slack, but I'm gonna use the example anyway. But say you've got a family Slack for some reason um, and you're a bit less careful with what you open or, or whilst you're on that because you're like, oh, it's just my family Slack, right? It's not that important. And say you're a bit more cautious about it than when you're on your work Slack and you think, right, this is quite a serious thing that I need to make sure I don't click on dodgy links. What, um, what you could do with this exploit was, because it was just overwriting a file on disk, if I was on my family Slack and someone sent me the link and I clicked open, it could actually overwrite 
your company's Slack as long as you're um, logged in on the, the same device. So kind of in that way, even though you were, um, it was you know like on a one Slack that you were opening the file, it could actually overwrite from the other one and kind of pivot onto a different organization. And it was the same same thing again. So I'd have to kind of sit on the server, store JWTs, and then be able to call the API, the Slack API, with that um, token in the same way as um, if I was logged in. So I could do a lot of different actions. And the other fun thing, fun for me, was that if you um, if you've got someone's token, it's Slack, right? So it's a messaging app that um, I could then use that in order to send the file to other people so it would come from the compromised user. And then that way it would, kind of, it would be possible, which obviously I didn't do, but it would be possible to sp have that automatically spread by having uh, different Slack messages going from lots of different people at the same time. And I've already mentioned the account bypassing, which would be attacking one, at uh, one account in order to pivot onto a different one. So that's the vulnerability in Slack. So I'm going to finish with talking about securing your applications or securing applications that you care about. Uh, there was a really good talk this morning about the um, MAS and MASTG. So the, it's the Mobile Application Security Testing Guide. And I was poking around for the bits of the, which I was sure was in there in hindsight, that I could have found that would tell me how I would, could have caught this vulnerability in testing. So. Um, this one here is um, testing for Java objects exposed through web views. So that's obviously what the, in the Basecamp example, that's kind of what, what was happening was inside the web view, it was uh, an exposed Java object and it was calling out to, obviously they're a function, but there wasn't enough, there wasn't enough checks in there to stop it from going to my server. Another one which is maybe more specific was testing deep links. So there's a lot of um, guidance around like testing the links that open up the application in the first place. And I think that's probably the best place to catch that kind of vulnerability is to check for any links as they come in to make sure that they're not compromised. Uh, the final one I'd say is um, for, the, for the Slack app, I didn't actually find very much about uh, directory traversal in there. So um, one of my colleagues has opened up a ticket, so hopefully we'll contribute that in soon. But that's another sort of thing to bear in mind is that looking for potential uses of file and then check in to see if there's a directory traversal in there. And I think, and this is probably always the case or very often the case with um, AppSec is, is always about input validation. So in Basecamp specifically, there was insufficient verification of the proceed underscore two parameter. So it had already checked 3.basecamp.com for the, the main URL, but it just didn't check it on that second one. And then the other place is when um, downloading an image, you could have put in some code to check there that it was going to the, the right server. But it's not actually as straightforward as people might think it is. So it's not just, oh, check it's there. And I've seen this code quite a lot, not here, but in other apps, url.containsbasecamp.com. But this, for example, would bypass that. So if I just put ignore this as a random query parameter, that does pass that check. And there's a number of other things they're sort of like putting things and then put an at at there and that they'll get processed as valid and um, syntactic like thing for talking to the FTP server, which nobody knows about, nobody uses, but could actually be used to bypass these types of checks. And at full disclosure, so I wrote this library sort of related to some of these bugs, but to try and come up with a similar approach to um, like a default deny thing where instead of accidentally um, letting some of these things through that you explicitly deny any URL and deny any file until it meets certain rules. So as an example, this would be the modified code for Basecamp when, um, when that verify proceeding score two parameter comes in. So it's got um, .url verification and then you, you allow the host. So basically without doing that, it would deny all of the URLs that were coming in. A similar one then in if we'd have done that for when it was calling out to the image server, that was the, kind of other, the other place that I think you could have caught it. So you could do the same sort of thing again. So you do URL verification and make sure that it's only going to try and download an image from that place by allowing the host. With Slack, there's, there was two places that I felt like you could have caught it. Um, 
The first one was when you uploaded the file, like at that point, I'm kind of surprised that it didn't, to be honest, that actually uploading and having uh, that kind of stuff in there, you'd have expected something like WAFs or some kind of like validation when things were being uploaded. And then the other thing is the file name validation when downloading that file, so on the mobile part of it. And again, this isn't usually as straightforward as you think it's going to be. Um, this is a dot .contains is another thing if you check for dot, dot .slash, but again, it's like your own coding in a lot of languages, that will be processed in the same way, um, but would not pass that check there. So again, it's, um, uh, there's a similar thing in that library. So if you do file.verify file, you can explicitly say which directories it should go in or explicitly say which files it should be in. And by doing that, you kind of like, again, it's that sort of default deny mentality where you don't let people do anything and then you're really explicit what, about what you are gonna allow, which isn't quite how, um, you know, like this kind of programming is normally done. It's quite more per permissive. And the final thing I'd say on that, the Slack vulnerability is, I think it requires a bit of a mindset shift. So in that example, what I was actually, I would actually ask Slack to do is to treat things that were coming from their own servers as being suspicious. And that's something that I think a lot of people and a lot of developers are loath to do, sort of like defensive programming sometimes feels like overkill. And I think, um, it's adopting some of those, the mentalities that we see in like particularly networking around zero trust security and actually assume that the server isn't delivering you safe content and that you do need to be a bit more um, careful with how you're handling the output and treat it as if it's user input because it could have come in through that. And I think this is particularly kind of relevant where um, I've been looking a lot at LLM security and the kind of stuff that that produces now is like you need to be really skeptical of what your server's coming because uh, what's coming from your server because client-side applications that blindly trust it will be vulnerable to these types of attack. So to conclude, um, verify everything with default deny, which is something that everyone here will probably have been saying for years and years and years. Carefully guard your application's entry point. So the intent receiver is a really obvious one. That's something that uh, applications can open. So there's, there are a very small number of entry points on mobile applications, and those are the ones to look out for. And then finally, uh, never trust, always verify, which is the kind of um, zero trust motto. And I think it can apply to application security more and more if you think about where stuff is coming from and making sure you verify, even if it's from a trusted source. So uh, I mentioned this at the start or halfway through. So on that link is um, my contact information and also to uh, send you to a blog. And on that is a write up of these two vulnerabilities if you're interested. Um, and you'll also find that GitHub library there as well. I messed up the timing of my things. I'm not sure how long is we've got left. Got 10, more minutes. 10 more minutes. So yeah, we've got plenty of time for questions if anyone has any. Yeah, I originally had a much longer version of this where I went through and just pointed out like um, SAS tools. So I deliberately ran it through a couple of SAS tools for specifically the directory traversal stuff and that um, that, that came up with nothing, and that, which I was actually quite surprised at. I thought like blindly loading in files and the directory from an external source would get picked up, but um, the ones I tried didn't, didn't find it. The Basecamp one is kind of more interesting because it's, I'm not sure it's a bug in the sense of like, you could have wanted all of that stuff to happen. It's much more of a logic bug. There's not um, like a specific coding practice in there that was that was bad it, and it was quite a long winded way of getting to it. So uh, I, I also ran it through there and, but I didn't kind of expect that to, to come up with it because, because of the nature of it. Arguably there could have been a DAS tool that could have done it. Uh, yeah, I think I think that's probably fair. Yeah, I think it's more. It was less about uh, once you're kind of have executed that first phase in it. I think that's that was the like the main vulnerability, if you get I guess. And I think that's probably the one that they patched. 
The um, the one intern internally though was with that library that the whole a lot of the app was based around navigating people around. So it felt like if you don't actually stop that one, there's probably a number of other bugs in there that could, you know, like the options for, for anybody to execute JavaScript or HTML and get that into a web app feels like quite wide. So, and so protecting it at that point would still seem, seem like a sensible thing to do. Any more? Thanks very much.